Hello everyone, Tim here. Back for another episode, back for another week. I'll talk if you'll listen, episode 33. This episode is jam-packed. I mean, super jam-packed with so many different things. I can't even, I don't even know where to start. Uh, I'm going on vacation this week, so I'm really excited about that. I'll be talking about some very interesting points surrounding marriage as well. Uh, Something got brought to my attention this week regarding marriage, and I decided to do a little bit of investigating, and my investigation brought back some very interesting details. I tried to be as fair as I could be. I tried to get some feedback from a couple of people, and I would love to hear what you all think about some of the things I discovered. I have a really, really special guest later on in the show, Adam DeColibus. He is an author of a book that just came out called Caravan, and I'm really excited to talk about his book uh, with Adam, and uh, Adam was kind enough to bless us with his presence. He's going to be on the show. We'll hear from him a little later on, and it was a huge, huge uh, interview. It was really fun. It's one of the funnest interviews I've had. I'm really excited for you all to to hear that. So, Also, a new lifestyle change. I'll be moving soon. If you guys remember a couple episodes ago and even last episode, talking about moving in and some of the challenges and some of the things I've I've been excited about regarding moving in. That's that's almost finalized. I say almost because the lease hasn't been signed yet. Technically, it's not official yet. Once ink hits the paper, once the lease is signed, that's when it's official. But We found a really nice place. I'm really excited about it. And there are a ton of opportunities for the show to grow based on the decision that we decided to make in getting this place. So I'm really looking forward to that. But it was nerve wracking at times. But, you know, it was really easy for me to stay calm during the whole situation and just kind of like be patient. You know, you don't ever want to force anything. But just a word of advice. I I do want to give some advice to people out there who are looking to move in with their girlfriend or they're looking to move in with anybody and they're looking to apartment hunt. I just want to go ahead and I guess if I can narrow this down to three points, three main points to give you some advice on. Point number one, start looking very, very early. Even if you know you're not going to move until let's call it two, three, maybe even four, five, six months out, Start looking very, very early because you never know what might become available in the future. Initially, when I started this, it's like, hey, I'll be ready to move soon. Let me start. But I knew in advance that I was going to move. I didn't have a exactly pinpoint because I was month to month with my current lease. So my lease, my lease was up in 2016. So once 2016 came around, I was month to month. So I had a lot of flexibility on when I could leave. And I only had to give my landlord 28 days notice. So I was month to month and I could basically leave whenever I wanted to. Uh, But my girlfriend, however, had a strict timeline on when she had to find a place and when she had to move out because she was still under lease. So that means once her lease was up, it was time for her to peace out. So that was something we had to consider. Looking back on it, what I would change, what I would do differently is I would definitely start looking way sooner. And one thing that I came across was the the fact that apartments become available two, three, four months later on down the line because you never know when pe- other people's leases are up and when that they're planning on moving. So for example, let's say you're looking to move in January. You might want to reach out to an apartment complex, let's say October or November, because there could be someone who has a lease up in January. So don't think I was under the impression that like, oh, as soon as I start looking, that's when I pretty much have to leave. Don't think that, you know, apartment, an apartment is going to be available right away. It might be a situation where somebody might be in the same boat as you are and they want to move. So their lease is up at about the same time you want to move. And it it really helps to kind of, you know, get out ahead of the curb and uh, start doing that. So I definitely recommend doing that. Start looking well in advance, whether it be two, three, four. Uh, months in advance. I probably would say maybe three months. That's probably the sweet spot. Definitely start then. Uh, Second form of advice I would get is, you know, start saving up right away. As soon as you know you're going to move, start putting money aside right away. Otherwise, if you wait until the last minute, you might, you'll find yourself in a pickle where you're, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul type of thing. 
where, you know, one bill or two bills might get overlooked just so you can have enough money to move in. And you might find yourself in a situation where you are leaving your previous place in a bad situation. So, for example, if you're thinking, oh, hey, I don't really have to pay the electricity bill or, hey, I don't care if my rent is late or, hey, I don't care if my Internet bill is late because I'm not going to be living here and I'm moving into a new situation. A new situation as far as living concerned doesn't necessarily mean a new situation as far as your bills are concerned. There are a lot of times where you might be transferring your Internet or you're transferring your gas or your electric or any other utility or service that you may have. You may be transferring it over to a new place. So your address doesn't stay the same, but your account stays the same. Your account history stays the same. All of that stays the same. You might be thinking to yourself like, oh, you know, I can pay the electricity bill later than normal or, oh, I don't have to worry about, you know, paying this internet bill one time and then lo and behold you're stuck with the same internet company when you move to your new place you have to take a uh, step back and go wow okay yeah maybe I shouldn't have did that so start saving up right away not necessarily for the moving but just planning for everything else that goes into the day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month routine for you as far as your bills go and the third and final thing that I would recommend at this point, I mean, there's so many other things to dive into, but if I had to pick a top three, the number, the number three thing would be, you know, start packing early. Uh, don't buy extra stuff, even when it comes to groceries. You don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're buying a lot of perishable food. And I'm not talking things like canned goods or dry goods or anything like that. I'm talking about things like milk or, you know, things that need to be stored in the freezer or the fridge. Otherwise, they'll go bad. Don't go grocery shopping a week, two weeks, maybe even three weeks before you plan on planning on moving out. Just get things, small things, maybe get, you know, a half a gallon of milk as opposed to a gallon of milk. You know, maybe only get a half dozen of eggs as opposed to a dozen of eggs. Just try to limit things. Uh, you're going to start packing up very soon. You don't want to bring anything extra like groceries, especially things that might go bad between you moving you don't want to buy any extra furniture or silverware or any extra items that you'll need to carry or transfer. For example, I'm looking to get a new TV. There are also a few other things that I'm looking to get. However, I'm going to wait until I'm settled into my new place because by no means do I want the, the item to get delivered before I'm even there. And then it's just sitting. A. B. I don't want the item to get delivered to me where it's just sitting, A, I'm like a big kid. If I get a new TV, I'm going to want to open it right away. So I'm going to open it. I'm going to hook it up, see how it looks, play around with it, and then lo and behold, I have to pack it back up and move it. If I don't open it up and it is just sitting for about a week or two, so what? Now that's an extra item that has to go in the U-Haul or the friend's car or the car or how, whatever your moving apparatus is. That's some extra things that you got to worry about. So I hope that helps you all. Again, it may seem like it's common knowledge to some people, but I tell people all the time, you know, common sense is uncommon. It really is. And there are a lot of things that you don't need to know until you need to know them. Things like setting up a doctor's appointment, health insurance, renter's insurance, car insurance, things like that. You're kind of just expected to know. And you kind of have this really small window of when you can ask about stuff like this like moving, like transferring your electricity bill, things like this. If you ask when you're too young, when it doesn't apply to you, you know, someone who knows about the process already might say something along the lines of, oh, you're too young for that. Don't worry about that. That'll come up later on down in the line. Then you find yourself in a situation where if you miss that window and you ask when it's quote unquote too late, you'll get hit with a lot of ridicule and a lot of, you know, uh, someone looking down their nose at you where they're like, oh, what do you mean you don't know how to set up a doctor's appointment for yourself? What do you mean you don't have a health savings account? What do you mean you don't have a 401k? What do you mean you don't know how to sign up for renter's insurance? They kind of look down on you like you just are supposed to notice. It. Like after a certain age, you should just know. Not realizing that if you don't ask during a certain window, I like I like to think about maybe 18 between the, between the ages of 18 and 21, it's kind of like that sweet spot where like if you're 18, 19 years old and you're going up to your mentor or older brother, mother, father, whomever it is, and you're like, hey, I don't really know how to set up my insurance. So I don't know what a copay is. You know, they go, they look at you like, oh, you're young. Why would you know this? You don't have life experience. 
But let's say you find yourself in a situation where you're living with your parents and I believe you're good to go to be on your parents' insurance up until like age 25 or something like that. Let's say you're living with your parents until the age of like 28. And then for like three years, you don't go on a doctor's appointment or something along those lines. And don't make a face because you know, like I know, some of you haven't been on a doctor's appointment or been to a doctor's office in a very, very long time. So don't act like, you know, it's uncommon for somebody to not go to a doctor's appointment in so long. It happens. So next thing you know, you find yourself in a situation. You've been living with your parents up until 28. You've been on insurance up until 25. You finally get a good job, you get benefits, and now your arm's hurting. Now your leg's hurting. Maybe you have a really bad toothache. Maybe you had a really bad fall, and now you got to get a doctor's appointment or check up or go to an urgent care. And now you're asking these questions to your older brother, your parent, whomever, and you're 28, 29 years old, and you're like, hey, I don't know how to do this. They kind of look at you with a, a side eye, like, what do you mean you don't know how to do this? You're a grown-ass man. You're a grown-ass woman. What do you mean you don't know how to do this thing? And now you kind of get trapped in this prison where you can't ask. Otherwise, you someone looks down on you. And if you don't ask, now you're stuck in perpetual ignorance. So it's like this purgatory that you're stuck in. So um, just throwing this information out here as far as the move goes, the top three things. For anyone who maybe finds themselves in that pur- purgatory, where they feel like they can't ask or they're too proud to ask or they feel like they should just know. Some people have the wherewithal to to ask or to go online and do some research because some people know what they don't know, uh, but then some people don't even know what they don't know. They don't know what to ask. They don't know what to look for. So definitely something to keep in mind, and I hope that helps you out. I'm really happy to kind of get this out of the way because, like I mentioned, I had vacation coming up. And I'm super excited for my vacation. So you all probably remember me speaking about Otakon last year. And it's a really popular anime convention. It's probably the second or third largest anime convention in the country. This year, like last year, is taking place in D.C. And I'm really excited to go. I'm going to meet up with one of my old high school buddies um, who actually was on the show not too long ago. I don't know if you all remember uh, Robert, um, a.k.a. Bobby. Uh, he was featured on the Lola's, uh, I'm sorry, the Kalani's Butterflies uh, episode, if you all remember that, about the nonprofit. Uh, he'll be down there in the D.C. area, so I'm definitely going to hang out with him. And I'm really excited because I actually get to see his kids. So he has two kids. Um, I'm actually going to get to see them, which is pretty cool. And it, it puts you in a really weird space because, A, that's how you know you're getting old when you're excited to see your friend's kids. You know, I might as well sign up for my AARP membership now. B, though, you kind of got to see you, you get to see point A and up to a point where, you know, where they are currently in their life. And it's really awesome to see that growth and that maturity. And it's at on one level really weird to see someone that you grew up with or someone that you went to high school with have kids. It's really weird to see their kids, especially when their kids are like 10, 11 years old. But at the same time, it's also really, really cool because it kind of gives you a glimpse into what that world is, especially if you don't have any kids like myself. It gives you a glimpse into what that world is. And I think it's really interesting to hear a parent's point of view when they are about your age because it gives you a little bit of insight on what to expect uh, out of certain things that you can relate to on a level. For example, if you go up to your parents or your uncles or anyone that's your parents or uncles or aunt's age, they're going to give you what it was like raising a 10 year old, you know, 20, 30 years ago, because now it's like, okay, yeah, we didn't have technology the way that we do now. We didn't have social media. So the thing, there are some like transferable points, things like puberty, things like dealing with the opposite gender or the same gender and things like that. As far as love interest goes, things with, you know, peer pressure and dealing with a bully in school sometimes stuff like that is transferable no matter what day decade you're talking about it can apply but then there are other certain things like for example i got my first phone when i was in ninth grade so i was 14 years old i had got my first phone it was a prepaid phone it was a track phone i had to go out and buy minutes on it myself my mom got me the phone 
as a as a birthday gift, I want to say. It was either a birthday gift or it was a gift for getting into high school. I don't remember. And she got me my first set of minutes for free, uh, you know, for not for free. It was free for me. It wasn't free for her. And but everything after I was responsible for. So I had to use my, you know, money that I made during over the summer for summer jobs or my allowance money to actually buy my own minutes for my phone. But I didn't get that until 14 years old. There's kids now that are like five with phones. And it's, you know, on one end, really crazy. On the other end, it might just be normal. Because think about our parents who didn't get Ataris until they were probably like adults. And here we are with a Sega Genesis or a Nintendo at like five. You know, to them, it might be the same thing. So um, it really gives you a lot of insight if you can talk to someone who is a parent, especially if you went to school with them um, and they're your age. It gives you a lot of insight. So I am I am in a weird way really excited about that and just looking forward to meeting his kids. And I can say the, the infamous line, I went to school with your dad. You know, um, I'm really excited to kind of take on that role. And uh, I can't wait to see that um, experience play out. But aside from that, I'll be really immersed into Otakon. The first time I went to Otakon was... The first time I went to any anime convention was Otakon, and that was back in 2015. It was August of 2015 or July, one of the two, August or July of 2015. And I had previously gone to Disney, but after coming back from Otakon, I felt like it was the best experience in my life. And depending on when you ask me, uh, my answer might change. You know, the best time of my life was when I went to Disney back in 2013. And the best time of my life was also when I went to Otakon in 2015. So it was like 1A and 1B as far as my favorite and best experiences of all time. And I cannot stress the importance of doing something that you love to do and being around other people who enjoy doing that. If you are an introvert and you don't want to go out and you want to stay in, don't do anything and just maybe dick around on your phone or watch Netflix all day, then if you are with someone else who wants to do that with you, that's the time of your life. If you're an extrovert and you want to go out and just, you know, maybe go to a carnival, a park, a happy hour, a club or anything like that and just, you know, have a conversation with people and meet new people and learn, and just have new experiences – you're going to have the time of your life when you are with someone else who wants to do that. So the same rule applies to things like whether it be tattoos, whether it be anime, whether it be gaming, whether it be, uh, you know, talent development conventions, whatever. There's a million conventions out there for whatever you think you're into, whether it be bars for bartenders, whether it be, you know, for, for architects, there's conventions out there for any and everything and whatever you figure is your passion whether it be a tv show or whatever there is an event for that and if you go there and you're surrounded by complete strangers but they all have the same passion and love that you have for whatever that thing is you'll have the time of your life so for any and everyone there's one particular friend that comes to mind where she is not into anything that i'm into for the most part and whenever I bring up nerdy stuff, she kind of gives me a face um, or it's kind of like she she's happy that I'm into it, but like she can't relate at all. Um, there are other young ladies and other young men out there, particularly a lot of my lodge brothers for that for that fact. A lot of my frat brothers where if they ask me, what did I do? And I'm like, oh, I stayed in the house and played the game all day because I didn't leave the house. They kind of look down their nose at me and go, you wasted your day. You stayed in the house and played the game all day. You know, versus if I said, hey, I stayed in the house and I read a book, all, I read books all day. Oh, it, it would be fine. It wouldn't be a big deal. Or if I said, hey, I went out and I stayed in the park all day and just chilled. Or I went to different bars around the city all day and just hung out. They wouldn't think it's a big deal with that. So it just it proves the point that you need to find people and surround yourself with people that are into what you're into. It doesn't necessarily have to be a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It doesn't have to be your best friend. It doesn't even have to be somebody you see every day. But if you know people and you have friends and you surround yourself and they like the th same things you do, surround yourself with them. Because you'll find that you'll have the time of your life whenever you do the same things that they enjoy doing and they're doing the same things that you enjoy doing. And 
that's what I really, really enjoy about Otakon. Um, I'm so excited to go and just be around, fr A, friends that I haven't seen in a while, first of all. First of all, I really enjoy these people and I haven't, I don't get a chance to see them often. Just where I work, where I live, where they work, where they live, our work schedules, things like that. It's really tough. Being an adult can be really, really taxing on a friendship, especially when you're an active adult and you got a lot going on. It can be really, really taxing for certain friendships. So you jump at any opportunity that you get to see your friends. And I'm really excited about Otakon. For those of you who don't know, Otakon is an anime convention. Anime is short for Japanese animation. So if you think cartoons like The Simpsons or Courage the Cowardly Dog or Archer, that's more like American style animation. Um, in Japan, their cartoons are a little bit different. So um, when uh, Japan animation or Japan animation, it's, it's also known as Japan animation, and then it got short to anime. Uh, became popularized it kind of worked its way on over into the u.s i want to say like late 70s early 80s or something like that it really had a boom in the 90s as well and um it took the western world by storm so you know somebody who's in anime trust me in fact you probably grew up and watched anime and didn't even realize it was anime where well, you grew up on dragon ball z which is like the most popular one or you grew up on you know gundam wing or you grew up on sailor moon that's anime, and trust me, it's really, really engrossing stuff, and it's super, super fun. It also influenced certain anim uh, certain animation and cartoons that we have over here today. Um, the biggest one that I can think of is um, an anime but slash cartoon because it was an American anime that was popular on Nickelodeon called Avatar, The Last Airbender. So that was heavily influenced by Japan animation or anime. And it, uh, just like anything else, it has, you know, you can go to conventions that focus in, on anime and have a theme regarding anime. And Otakon is one of those conventions. And Otakon has been around for a very, very long time. I want to say late, late 90s. I could be wrong about that, but very, very, very long time. And it usually takes place in Baltimore, but due to some construction or something going on with the Baltimore Convention Center... It's going to D.C., which isn't too far. And luckily, I'm in Philly, so we can kind of just drive on down, me and some friends. And I'm really excited. My favorite part about being there is just being around other people who have an interest in what I'm interested in. There's like maybe two people that I see on a daily basis that are into anime that I, that I work with, but I don't have to interact with them in any capacity. Where one of them isn't, we're not in the same department. The other person, we're not on the same team. In fact, he sits like three, four rows from me. So we don't ever need to interact. We work different shifts. We don't ever need to interact. So, you know, my girlfriend, she's not into anime. Um, she's not into the nerd culture. And my friends who are, I don't get to see them often. So here's this thing that I'm like super passionate about, that I'm very passionate about and that I thoroughly enjoy, that I don't get to experience with other people on a daily basis and even weekly or monthly basis. Every time I'm watching anime, I'm watching it by myself. So this is like a huge thing for me that I get to go and be around somebody. Can you imagine being into something that you think is like really quirky? Whether it be like, let's say you like to build model airplanes or let's say you're really into trains or let's say you're really into like architecture or something like that. And you think like none of my friends are into this or the friends that are into this, I never get to see them. Now imagine going to that place that's full of people from all over the world, not just your country, but the world who have the same love and passion about this thing. It's really the weird quick. You think you're the only person on the planet that likes art or the only person on the planet that likes a specific type of art or a specific type of show. When you get to this place, it's like a mecca. Because everyone there feels about the same, feels the same way about these things as you do, if not more. So it's really, really cool. That's the thing I'm looking forward to most. I also like to see the cosplay. Now, cosplay is short for a costume play, where basically someone assumes the role or dresses up as a anime character. But the cool thing about a lot of these cultures, like anime and video games, they kind of bleed into one another. So although it's an anime convention. 
There are a lot of animes based on video games. There are a lot of animes based on comics. In fact, there's an anime version of Batman um, where he's a ninja. And that's pretty cool. So I would say look into that if you're in the comics or if you're in the Batman. So a lot of this culture bleeds into other cultures. So you'll see people dress up as all types of stuff, whether it be a character from your favorite cartoon, whether it be a character from your favorite movie or show, whether it be a character from your favorite video game or anime. I love seeing that because the amount of effort that people put into their costumes is so crazy to me. And I mean crazy in a good way. Um, I play a game, a video game right now on the Xbox One called Overwatch. And I've been playing it since it came out. So I'm obsessed with this game. It's really, really cool. And one of the characters in the game, his name is Reaper. And he's dressed up in like this Grim Reaper style outfit. And he has these really cool dual shotguns. Um, and there was a guy last, last Otakon who was dressed up as Reaper. And not just dressed up as Reaper. Like full on outfit he spent a ton of money on this outfit it looked really cool it was very detailed he had the guns the guns weren't like stuck to the outfit they were actually separate guns and it's really really cool uh, if you ever have any limitations on what you think you can do with paper mache look up some of these outfits it's really really crazy um there's another character in the game overwatch called um farah or farah depending on how you want to pronounce her name and she's a really cool uh, young lady. Um, she's from Egypt, and she's just a badass. And she has, like, this flight suit, this mech flight suit kind of. And, you know, she uses a jetpack to propel herself up into the air. Last year, I saw, one, saw someone in that suit, and the wings actually moved. So she had this mechanism somewhere in her suit that moved. The wings actually moved, and it was really, really dope. Um, the last example I'll give you, if you're familiar with a game called Mortal Kombat or the movie Mortal Kombat, there's a character in Mortal Kombat called Raiden. And Raiden is a, the god of thunder, even though he uses electricity, which is the same thing with Thor, right? He's the god of thunder, but he uses like electricity. It's crazy. Anyway, anyway, so he, uh, this guy who dressed up as Raiden had these really cool uh, effects. But the best part about the effect is Raiden, the actual character Raiden, his eyes glow blue because he's a guy and I guess glowy eyes is otherworldly. So this guy cosplaying as Raiden last year, his eyes were blue. And for the life of me, nobody could figure out how he got everything to do it. So finally, I figured it out. He had these two blue lights. Um, Raiden wears a hat, like a you know Japanese style hat. I don't know what the name of the hat is called, but uh, he wears a hat. And the guy who was cosplaying Raiden had the hat on and he had the lights on the inside brim of the hat shining down on his eyes that gave it the appearance that his eyes were glowing. So it was really, really cool. The amount of effort that people put into their outfits, the amount of work that goes into it, you can't help but to respect it. And, you know, part of me gets a little bit upset when somebody looks at that and they go, wow, that person's crazy. Why would they spend all that money on that? I guarantee you one person's quirk is some, something crazy for somebody else. There could be a situation where, you know, someone spends $200 on a game, a collector's edition of a game, whether it be a board game, like a tabletop game, or whether it be a video game, or they could spend like $200 on a ticket to go see a show. You might think that's crazy. Like, why would you spend that much money on something like that? But you probably dropped a crap load of money on a tattoo that you got. So, or a pair of sneakers or an outfit or a bag or something like that. They're, they're, everyone has a quirk that they want to spend their money and their time and their effort on. And to see the effort that goes into these outfits are amazing. So I can't wait to be in, you know, a city that I don't live in. You know, it's always fun to travel. I'm really great to go out with some friends and be around people who are really interested into, uh, you know, in, have a huge interest in what I'm interested in. And of course, I can't wait to see some of the outfits and learn more about the different anime that I see on a re regular basis. So I'm really looking forward to that. So Otakon is this week. It's coming up and it's technically on Friday. That's the 26th, I believe. And I'll be leaving on Thursday, which is the 25th, 
So because I'll be away, although I may be featured on another podcast, I'm not sure about that yet. So I don't want to, you know, give any names on the podcast because I'm not I'm not entirely sure. Although I might be featured on another podcast. And if I am, follow my social media. I will tweet that out and I will post that on my Instagram. But there won't be a show next week, everybody, because I won't even be here. I won't be coming back until the following Monday, which I believe is the 29th. And, you know, of course, I have work the next day, but I'll be sure to recap my Otakon experience when I, you know, the following weekend when I record the episode. But there will not be an episode next week. So I want to let you all know that now. But I can't wait to go. I can't wait to share it. Keep an eye out on my Instagram to make up for the fact there won't be an episode next week. I will be doing a ton of live streams. I'll be doing um, a lot of live streams. It'll primarily be focused on Instagram. But keep an eye out on Twitter as well. If you don't know what my Instagram or my Twitter, um, you don't know what those handles are, take a look at description, the description in any of these shows episodes, including this one, for all of that information. I'm going to post all of this stuff on YouTube as well. I'm going to post it on Instagram just to share a little bit of my experience with you all. So that way you can, in a way, be at Otakon too if you... Uh, couldn't go or if you're curious as to what it's like moving on everybody I came across an interesting topic I was having a conversation with a buddy of mine and the topic of marriage came up he's been with his wife for quite some time and he and I just started to dive into the concept of marriage and I started to notice a trend between the men that I speak to about marriage and the women that I speak to about marriage and just marriage in general So when I was talking to my buddy, he told me that he didn't really feel ready to get married, but he felt like he had to get married. And I asked him, well, hey, why why did you feel that way? And he said, well, just as the man, I felt like it was something I had to do. You know, I know, you know, at the time, his girlfriend, but his wife now, he knows that she was kind of getting fed up with the, you know, she felt complacency uh, occurring in their relationship. And she felt like it was very, very stagnant. And he kind of felt like he had to marry her to get her out of that. And, you know, I spoke to when we had that conversation, it was very, very one mature of him to even bring that up. But two, it kind of made me wonder, like, wow, you know, I know another buddy of mine who's a guy as well, who's ecstatic about his marriage and couldn't wait to marry the young lady that he was with. So I called him up. Um, I shared some of, you know, I try to keep, you know, my other friend's privacy was number one priority, but um, I shared some of the things that were discussed with this friend of mine. And he was like, his experience was completely different. He couldn't wait to get married. He actually proposed to his wife, now wife, but he proposed to his wife and she said, no, she felt like, you know, the marriage was moving, the relationship was moving too fast. So he kind of had to reel it in a little bit. And then he proposed to her again, I think it was like a year and a half later or something along those lines. And it was after they were already living with each other. And she said yes. And it kind of raised another point like, wow, why did she say no? And he said, well, she felt like they weren't where they needed to be yet in life in order to make that step. And I was just like, wow, you know, it's so crazy how everyone has this thing. Marriage has no opinion. Marriage has no preference. Marriage is marriage. Marriage is an act. Marriage is a verb. You get married. You know, it's a verb and a noun, but you get what I mean. It just happens. But to have all these different people, um, me, you, our friends, have this different perspective on what marriage is, is crazy to me. And what their viewpoint on when it should happen, when it shouldn't happen, was crazy to me. And I spoke to one more person. This time I tried to keep it balanced. So I spoke to a young lady. She's a little bit older. She's in her her early 40s. And I spoke to her about marriage. She's divorced now. um, And she is dating currently, but she's divorced. She was married and it didn't work out. And I had a conversation with her and she was providing me a crazy amount of insight. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. And I had to do a little bit more research on it. So here's what she said. Check this out. She said, based on her experience, both with her and a lot of the female friends that she has, that she speaks, that she speak currently speaks to, and that she spoke with, is men in general get married because they want to secure the relationship with the person that they're with. So let me say that again. 
a man, whether it be a same-sex marriage or whether it be a man and a woman, the man will propose to the woman, one, just out of ego. He feels like he needs to as the man. He needs to take that step and move it forward. But B, he proposes to secure the relationship. In his mind, he locks that woman up and that's his. Now, the woman can't go anywhere. The woman is now they can build a family together and he can kind of like secure his foundation. And he feels like that's a necessary part of being a man is to secure that partner. And I, that blew me away. I, I never heard that answer before up until I did some research and I found that there was a lot of consistency among men across the country who feel the same way. But up until that point, I had never heard that answer before. So it was really crazy to me. She also told me that women feel like they need to get married because they feel like it's the next phase of the relationship. She said women look at uh, three key things as milestones in a relationship in order for the relationship to progress. They look at stability. They look at possessions. And they look at family. So what they mean by security is they feel like, hey, we need to have a house together. If we're together for X amount of years and we don't have a house together and, and listen to what I'm saying, I'm not saying necessarily living together. I mean, having a house together. Um, women want to move in together as well, but they look at it as, hey, we need to have this house together as a milestone. This this provides security to make sure we're squared away and we're good to go. They look at family in a sense of whether it's just family, extended family, like bringing the family together. I'm bringing your family together with my family or family in the sense of having children later on down the line. They feel like it's more secure to have children if you're married. So women feel like, hey, and this this is all according to this young lady. I don't, there, there are a lot of people who are going to do this thing that I hate. It's a huge pet peeve of mine where they go into it with a narrow mindset. Clearly, I'm generalizing everybody. I'm clearly generalizing. I'm not talking about each individual woman on the face of the planet, obviously. But there's people out there that's going to listen to this, that's going to do this really th this thing that I hate, where they're going to say, that's not true for me, so it's not true at all. This isn't true for me, so it can't possibly be true. I really encourage you to go into this with an open mind. And just don't even consider yourself a part of the equation and just listen to some of the statistics and some of the facts that I bring up. In this particular case, it was an opinion of an older woman. So just to put a cap on what she said, she's basically saying men feel like they need to get married because they have to. And women feel like they need to get married because they need to in order to like for validation. Like, OK, my decision wasn't a mistake. If I get married, then that's success. This reminds me of another story, and you know, I brought this up previously on another episode of a young lady that I know who is with her boyfriend. She's been with her boyfriend for quite some time. They have a child together, and she felt like the relationship wasn't going anywhere, and she started to listen list the things that she felt like was wrong with the relationship. And I said, well, hey, well, why is that? And she said she felt bad when her friends would come up to her and ask her, when is her boyfriend going to propose to her? And she felt like her relationship wasn't worth much because she's been with, together with this guy for a very long time and they weren't married. So I said, well, you know, what do you think will fix your relationship? And she flat out in so many words said marriage. So in her mind, marriage would fix the situation. Putting a ring on her finger would and or put a ring on her boyfriend's finger would fix the situation. So it means all the arguments, all the disagreements, all the insecurities would just fly out the window because they're getting married. And there, you'd be surprised about, you know, how many people out there think that way. And they think like, hey, this is the solution. This is the miracle drug that once this thing happens, it fixes every problem and solves all of the problems. And I just want to share a few statistics with you all. And then I want to ask a question and hopefully you all will answer over social media or via the show's email. And I just want to see what you all think about these statistics. So there was a poll conducted at Harvard not too long ago. I believe it was 2016 on the top reasons people felt like their relationship didn't work, that, that the marriage ended in divorce. So men were surveyed and women were surveyed of various ages. 
So they narrowed it down to a specific window and they said people who get married between the ages of 22 and 35 and ended in divorce, here were some of the reasons they did list it as the wrong reasons to get married. So this is both men and women under the age of 35 but older than 22 who had a divorce. Can you imagine that getting married at 22 and like at 24 having a divorce? Some people that's not surprising but for other people that might be tough to, to grasp. But here's some of the wrong reasons. You feel too guilty or ashamed to back out when plagued with doubt. So, for example, you, you make the commitment. You say, yes, I'll marry you. And now you're like, you know what? I can't back out because I made the commitment. And you kind of feel guilty. So you're, you're going to make this major decision, but you don't really want to or you have some doubts. And you feel like I'm too, I, I got to get married now, you know. Um, and that came back to bite them in the butt. Here's another reason. You are willing to gamble on your future spouse changing or having potential. So a lot of people fall in love with the people or they get engaged with the people that they want to be with, but not the person that they're with currently. So they have this vision that this person is going to change despite everything that the person has shown them so far. And, you know, they end up making a decision and the marriage ends in divorce. Here's another one to be free from your parents. A lot of people feel like they're under the thumb of their parents and they live with their parents or their parents make almost every major decision in their life and getting married will fix that. Here's another one, to have sex. Can you imagine people still have that old traditionalist mindset that you can't have sex until you're married? Some people genuinely still feel that way, whether it's due to tradition, whether it's due to life philosophy, or whether it's due to religious reasons. They feel like, hey, we can't have sex until we're married. Here's a, I'm just going to I'm going to go down a list here um, to ease lonely to ease loneliness. That's huge. Wow, that's crazy to be happy, which no one can make you happy, by the way. Only you can make you happy to show you are an adult. Ooh, that's deep. Wow. I should have read these before I read these all to you guys. That's deep because of pregnancy. Just because he or she loves you. To save, rescue, or help someone because you want a baby, for money, because all your friends are married, you've always wanted a fancy wedding or to wear the fancy dress or suit, out of fear that no one else will want to marry you, so you marry the person that you're with, you think you are running out of time to get married, wow, that's huge, to have someone to complete you. For immigration purposes, I actually know somebody personally, by the way, who was an immigrant, uh, I'm sorry, an immigrant from, I think it was Puerto Rico. No, it was Dominican Republic. And they came over here and married somebody. Mind you, they were gay. They, there's a gay guy. He came over here. He married, a, you know, one of his friends who's a woman just to be for legalization, to be legal here in the U.S., how crazy is that? He currently now has a relationship with a guy. He's in a relationship and lives in a completely different home than a person here he's married with. How crazy is that? Anyway, well, I guess not so crazy, right? You are tired of being single. Someone is pressuring you into getting married. You don't want people gossiping about the two of you living together to get health or insurance benefits from the spouse's employer. Wow. So all of these were reasons that people got divorced over or were the primary reasons that people got divorced over between the ages of 22 and 35. Now, on the flip side of that, to be fair, here are the reasons that, um, again, same poll, um, the people who were married and still married are, or were in a, a second marriage and they're happy with their second marriage. Here were the reasons that they said that they were still married, still married and, it, and it's still going on. You are in love with one another, a desire to share your life with another, to have a lifetime companion. You both have realistic expectations and shared goals, emphasis on shared goals. You would feel comfortable doing a premarital counseling to make certain this is the right choice. You want to feel connected with a person you love and to grow with that person emotionally. Willingness to be there for one another when you each fulfill your own needs and dreams. You both do not have blinders on and have spent enough time together to know it's the right choice. That's crazy, man. 
So as you can see, there's a huge contrast between the right reasons and the wrong reasons. And based on my own perception, it looks like all the right reasons involved how you felt about the other person and all the wrong reasons involved how you felt about something else. So all the reasons that people listed that they got a divorce has something to do other than the person that they with in, gen in, in general. And all the right reasons had to do with the person that they were with. So that was wild. So then I, I decided like, hey, even though this was a poll and these people's feelings are valid, I wanted to get some hard numbers. So I decided to look up some statistics on divorce. And it was a lot of different things that they factored in, but some pretty cool statistics that I looked into specifically. Who is getting divorced? When and why? So who is getting divorced? The average age for couples going through their first divorce is 30 years old. So on average, anyone who's married by 30 is probably going to get a divorce by 30. That's the average. 60% of all divorces involve individuals aged 25 to 39, which is crazy because that also kind of matches up with the poll that I was just referencing earlier. Another reason here. Wives are the ones who most often file for divorce at 66% on average. That figure has soared to nearly 75% in recent years. That is crazy. So that means, in general, women who feel like marriage is the next stage of the relationship and they need to get married to validate the relationship are also the ones who are most often filing for the divorce. How crazy is that? Now, that, had, that could have a lot to do with the men that they're with. You know, it could be due to infidelity. It could be due to other reasons. But that's still an alarming statistic. The median duration of first marriages that end a divorce for men is about 7.8 years and for women is about 7.9 years. So it's about the same. But that's a little disheartening to know the person you want to spend the rest of your life with, you're more than likely going to be divorced in less than 10 years. You know, that's pretty eye opening. But at the same time, people wait an average of three years after after a divorce to remarry, if they remarry at all. So people do go out there and they don't lose hope, which is very, very encouraging and somewhat inspiring. People don't lose hope after their first marriage. They kind of roll with the punches and move on and just accept that phase in their life. And they go from there. How often divorce takes place in the U.S.? Every 13 seconds, there is one divorce in America. That equates to 277 divorces per hour. Over a 40-year period, 67% of first marriages terminate. So that means everyone who gets married between the years of 2020 and 2060, 67% of those will end in divorce. That's huge. Researchers also estimate that 41% of all first marriages end in divorce, which is crazy. But then on the flip side of things, you know, there are people out there who love, love, love to be married and really look, really look forward to it and think it's a huge stepping stone. Now, I wanted to be fair and try to find some positivity as well. I wanted to get more insight on why people were getting divorced, but I also wanted to get some insight on why people actually wanted to get married and why people stayed married. So I looked up another article and Turns out there was another survey conducted by Harvard. Apparently, Harvard is very into marriage that listed um, reasons, the top 13 reasons that men either wanted to get married or stay married. Now, this was geared more towards uh, same uh, heterosexual relationships, but I'm sure a lot of it can be applied to same sex relationships as well, especially with more legalization coming in the future. But here are the top 13 reasons that men either want to get married or or stayed married. She embraces my vulnerabilities. She's my number one support system. She makes me genuinely happy and others can tell. She's per she's perfect wife or mother material. She never gives up on us. She had a good upbringing. She's into fitness. She cooks as well as my mother. She shares a spiritual connection with me. She's passionate about our connection. She supports my goals and ambitions. She knows me better than I know myself. And she's who I want to wake up to every morning. 
So this is a really eye-opening list, and it makes sense. I mean, as a man reading these, it makes total sense. If I was completely happy with my marriage, or if I definitely wanted to get married, these were this. This sounds like some things I would say. You know, it 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 makes sense. I can't see why anyone would necessarily disagree with this. But yeah, you know, the one that stands out to me the most was the reason number five. She never gives up on us. That's a very attractive trait uh, for a woman to have, for me anyway, to, you know, someone who doesn't give up on the relationship and she keeps trying and trying and trying to, you know, make the relationship work. That's definitely an attractive trait for me and I can see why that's definitely on this list. Now, there were, on the flip side of that, there was another list that men, that I came across that men listed as to why they don't want to get married. Uh, to them, they feel like there is no incentive to marry. So in their mind, there's no benefit uh, outside of just being with someone that they're already with. Marriage is not considered gentlemanly anymore. It's kind of kind of outdated. You know, it's just like a thing. Marriage and money matters. So, of course, if you don't have the money to get married, and that's a huge obstacle to get married. Children and married life. A lot of men say that they, according to this anyway, say that they aren't ready for children. And a lot of the women that want to get married, of course, wanted to have children and they wanted to start a family. And most men weren't ready for that, according to this survey. The leadership role in marriage changed a lot. It shifted more towards the woman. And a lot of men didn't feel like it was a partnership or that they were in control of a lot of a lot of the decisions being made. They felt like a lot of that was shifting more towards the woman. So, you know, there was something that they didn't agree with necessarily. So sexual intimacy and marriage. So check this out. Apparently married men have sex up to nine times less than unmarried men. And that's a huge incentive for men to want to get married. They feel like sex will increase because, you know, they're around the person more. But turns out it actually decreases. So they feel like that's a disadvantage. And finally, most men feel like the freedom in marriage is restricted they feel like they are losing a lot of liberties that they felt like they had before they were married and the peer pressure in marriage they feel like they're pressured to get married or they're not real men they're not in a real relationship so there were a lot of things that were on both sides of this argument where one thing supported like hey these are reasons why men want to get married and other people want to get married these are reasons why men don't want to get married. And it was all over the place. And it, it was pretty crazy to me um, that it was so much disparity between what I looked up where you'll find one. Art, and it just goes to show you that you'll always find what you're looking for. Right. And that's why I tried to be as fair as possible where you find that there's some articles that support like, hey, don't get married. There are some articles that support like, no, get married. Now is the best time ever. And it really ultimately falls up to the two people who are getting married, of course. But I just wanted to throw that question out there for you all, and hopefully I can get some really cool feedback from you all. So A, in your opinion, whether you're a man or a woman, regardless of your sexual orientation, in your opinion, why do you feel like men want to get married? And why do you feel like men don't want to get married? Same question for women. Why do you feel like women want to get married? Why do you feel like women don't want to get married? And finally, for everybody, again, why do you think men want to get a divorce why do you feel like women want to get a divorce and why do you think the numbers are so high lately why do you think people are waiting longer and taking a longer time to get married why do you think marriage was way more popular 20 30 years ago than it is now so i would love to hear you all's feedback i would love to hear you all's opinion on everything there are several ways to reach out to me if you've been listening up until this point you know what those ways are if you are a newer listener Check out the comments in the description below this episode, regardless of what platform you're listening to, for ways to get in touch with me and just share your thoughts and opinions. I'll also be tweeting different things out throughout the course of the week. I would love to hear your responses to those tweets, and I can't wait to hear back from everybody. Now, finally, um, before the break, I do want to tell you how excited I am about the interview coming up. And this was huge for me. It was the one of the first people to reach out to me over the show, uh, over the show's email address. And this person lives way out in California, so it was really, really dope to have the next guest onto the show. I was really, really excited, and you're going to hear it 
all over the place throughout this interview. So right after this break, we're going to listen to a really cool Idle Thought segment with guest author Adam DeCalibus. More right after this. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for enduring that break. A brother does have to pay some bills every now and again. This next guest coming up, like I mentioned before the break, is an author. He recently came out with a new book called Caravan. It just dropped. You'll find some information about where to find that in the description below this episode. California-based author, fairly new to writing as far as getting something out recently, but has been writing all of his life in general. So he's well-traveled. I can't wait for you all to hear this interview. I was really excited about it. So without further ado, here's guest author Adam DeCalibus. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Another week, another episode, another guest. This time around, we have Adam DeCalibus, who is an author of a novel that just recently came out on Thursday of this week called Caravan. Adam, how are you? I'm doing awesome. Great, man. Adam, I am super excited. This is my excited voice, if you can't tell. I'm super excited to have you on. Um, I can't tell you how much I've been looking forward to this, and I can't wait to dive into some of the topics that we have lined up to talk about. But before we dive into the topics that we laid out, I just kind of want to let the people uh, get an idea of who you are and what you do. So um, if you just want to take some time to just introduce yourself to the listeners. Sure thing. As Tim said, my name is Adam Caldas. Uh, I grew up in a small town in California. And uh, about the only thing I really remember being passionate about as a kid was story. My my whole life just revolved around story. I loved movies. I loved writing I just loved uh, being told and telling stories. It's it's something that was so passionate for me, something I was really passionate about. And up until a couple of years ago, I didn't really realize why. I figured out that at that time, it was like a time machine for me. And since I, I found a love for history at a really early age, it was a way for me to time travel. And uh, since I was you know just a kid in a small town, it was a way for me to go anywhere in the world at any time in history. So history and writing suddenly became really, really close to me. And uh, as I got older, uh, I decided to become more and more serious with it. And eventually when I was, when I was 13 years old, I had the original idea for Caravan. It was, it was one night where I was cooped up in the house and uh, the idea just, just hit me. And I started jotting down these ideas and all of a sudden, I found myself writing the first chapter of the novel. Um, I wrote eight pages, which is the most I'd ever written at, at one sitting, and it was like it was like love at first sight. I felt like I knew that I'd uh, stumbled across something special. So I took these pages to a friend of mine, who I showed every single story I'd ever written to, <laughs> and my friend did something surprising. My friend said, "Listen, I want to read your story." I can tell you're excited, but there's a there's a bit of a dilemma, and that is that you you think of this idea, you get really excited, you tell me about it, but you never finish it. And I'm left left disappointed. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was at that moment that I realized my you know I, because I wasn't following through, my my inability to follow through was leaving people disappointed, and it was um, negatively uh, affecting people other than myself. So. I I made a promise to my friend that I was going to finish this novel, and uh, sure enough, a month later I gave up. <laughs> oh man! But yeah, but uh, I I remembered the promise I made, and uh, I came back to it, and I wrote wrote it all by hand, and I uh, retyped it up, and I started the process of of actually writing and um honestly it kinda led me to where I am today. I've I've got a novel out, Caravan, and I've got a um independent publishing imprint called Third Line Publishing. And uh I'm just uh writing short stories and uh yeah, that's that's where I am today. But well, that's good stuff. And what I'm hearing from that is a kid grew up on the West Coast, uh traveled and passionate and you kinda pinpoint it and surround yourself with honest people because I think it took a lot for your friend to tell you that. 
There are a lot of friends who are afraid of losing their friendship, so they tell their friends whatever they want to hear. And I think that was a good wake-up call for your friend to say that to you, and it motivated you in a way that maybe wouldn't have otherwise happened if you didn't hear that. So uh, are you still in touch with that friend? Do you still talk to that friend? Oh, yeah, yeah, all the time, yeah. And I um, I think this person, I say, hey, you know, thanks for uh, kind of give, giving me a kick in the rear because um, – you know, there's only so much I can tell myself to do it. But when you've got, you know, when you're depending on someone else, when you, it's either you're going to let someone down or you're going to let yourself down. That's that's really special. So I, I thank this person a lot for that. That's good. And it's nice to have somebody around you who's sincere and genuine about that. And they just see the best in you. And they, they see that you are not hitting your potential. And they know that you have it in you and to just drive you and motivate you to get you to the next level. I think that's really, really cool. Now, you mentioned growing up in California, and more specifically, you said a small town in California. Now, California is the third, the third largest state. Now, uh, you know, sometimes people don't think small when they think about California. So I got some follow-up questions surrounding where you uh, grew up at. So what was the name of the town specifically? Uh, Springville. Springville. And what's the closest major city to that? Uh, probably Visalia. Wow. Yeah, that is, uh, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm on the East Coast. I'm from Philly. And, uh, I will tell you, definitely, I've never heard of either one of those places. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure it can, uh, kind of get overlooked by, uh, so many other cities in the state. But I'm sure, I'm sure you, you, you may do. Now, I did a little research on you, you know, you being the famous author that you are. I had to make sure that I was I was prepared to have you on the show. If I read right, it said, yeah, you started in California, but you traveled all over the world. And at one point, you were living in South America. You, uh, your book is based about the Sahara and Morocco. You, if I read this, read this right, been to seventeen countries. That's a lot of food, man. Uh, which place <laughs> was your favorite place to eat? Ooh, I would have to say. I would have to say Argentina. Ooh, why Argentina? Yeah, uh, well, actually, because well, the food over there. They when whenever you go and eat down in Argentina, you don't really get a choice to stop when you're full. <laughs> the <laughs> just the hospitality that they have over there. It, you you stop when you're about to explode. Um, but the besides that, the food is just delicious. The the conversation and just the environment that they have. It really adds to the whole experience. It's it's completely different than anything you can get going to a restaurant, uh, even if they serve the same food there. It's just the feeling of um, sitting at the table among friends and uh, enjoying this food that they made in their kitchen and that they spent the whole day making. There's something really special about that, and I don't think they do that uh, like they do in Argentina. Well, that's good stuff, and I'm sure that the food sounds uh, delicious. And one thing that people like to do when they eat, have food is talk. Uh, so I'm sure you've had a lot of conversations with not only the people in Argentina, but the people you've met all over the world. And one thing that I find is travel really puts things in perspective for you. You start mm-hmm. to see the cultural differences, but the more places you go, you start to realize that a lot of us are the same. And that's what makes things so great that we're a whole lot similar than we thought we were initially. Uh, what place did you visit that you started to feel more like at home? Even though you weren't originally from there, uh, you started to feel like you were from there. What place would you say that is, that was? Hmm. I would probably say I would probably say Russia. Oddly enough, I would probably say Russia because uh, the people over there, just because of their past and what they've been through, you know. Going through going through two world wars that didn't exactly work out well, and then you know with Stalin and everybody, um, it's just kind of part of their DNA to not complain and just uh, you know soldier on through the snow and 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 all that. But they're they are very they're very sweet people. It's hard to say uh, uh, you know because I feel like in the West at least we've kind of built up this stereotype, you know, played by, you know, all shorts figure, you know, of like the stone cold Russian. And and believe me, you know, there are a couple of them over there. But they're very they're some of the most genuine people I've ever met. And that goes both ways. You know, if they if they don't like you, they'll tell you straight out and they have no um no qualms about it. 
But if they're like, hey, man, you know, oh, that's really cool, you know, what you did, or, or man, you know, hey, I like the way you do that, or you're a nice guy, they'll tell you flat out, and you can tell it's it's genuine. And there's just something about that 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 resonates with me. I've 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 never been attracted to flattery or uh, you know being being kind, uh, uh, overly kind, um, or being fake or or not yourself. Of course, I I, I believe in not being a uh, you know, not being rude to people just just because you know you don't agree with them or whatever. You know, be kind, of be course. a good person. But uh, there's something about that that genuineness that just resonates with me. Oh, that's cool. I'm, I'm sure a lot of my listeners have never left their hometown, let alone travel to Russia. So I'm sure that adds perspective for them. And I like the fact that, and you sort of touched on it, that history can make you who you are as a person. And if you have shared history with somebody, even if you live on different sides of the world, if you have that thing to relate to, that similar thing to call back to, in a way, it really makes you close. And like you mentioned, there's a lot of history in Russia. There was a lot of history in South America. And your book takes place in a part of the world where there's a lot of history. And one thing that ties the world together is history. And we seem to be really obsessed with history. We seem to be really we our mind just our imagination goes off the walls when it comes to history and i was doing a little research on the different things the different medias surrounding history whether it be historical majors in college whether it be books whether it be games and the list is endless on top 100 historical movies top 10 historical video games the top five his- historical books, historically accurate or histor- historical fiction that you have to read. And it's all amazing. It's kind of like overwhelming as to why we're just obsessed with history. And check this out. Since 1981, all the way up into 2017, there have been 300 movies released based on history alone, whether it be fiction, mm-hmm. fictional or, you know, historically accurate. There have been over 300 movies released since 1981. Why do you think that is? Why do you think we're so obsessed with history? Hmm. I think, you know, I think about this a lot. And I think it's for the same reason that, that as a kid, when you come across any pictures of your grandparents, it kind of hits you differently than when you see your parents. And I think it's because we're really interested in where we came from. And especially, I think that we're at an era where it's easier to capture history than ever. Um, if you look at the total length of human history, sure, they had paintings, sure, they had statues and everything like that, but now it's when we've actually had recordings and photographs and film and, you know, just this, the, the amount of technology we have just allows us to capture it at a level that's never been possible before. And I think that history knowing where we came from and knowing our past, it's it's very important to who we are. I think that we can't really turn our heads away from that. I know that some people are, when they think history, they think, you know, they're thinking about school, they're thinking about college, they're thinking about history books. And uh, for a lot of people, that's just a complete turnoff. But I think that if you look at history a different way and you think, I think about this a lot. I, if I ever see somebody walking down the street, I like to think if I could rewind the tape and see this person's ancestor, let's say 300 years ago, I wonder where in the world they would be and what they'd be doing. Like, I wonder if they'd be a cheese maker in Holland or, uh, you know, a logger in Switzerland or whatever. And the craziest thing is that's all true. You know, that's a possibility. We, Mm -hmm. our history is so, it's so wide and it's so broad, especially in the States, because we, we've come from every corner of the world. And I think that knowing that history and being curious about it in the first place is just a fantastic thing that we're able to capitalize on in this era. Yeah, I, that's so true for so many reasons, especially to touch on what you said around, like, right now is the easiest time to retell history and to capture it, um, especially with the technology that we have available to us. And that goes across beyond just movies. Now we have video games. I me, mean, I'm an avid gamer. I worked for a very popular video game retailer for 10 years of my life, and I started at 16 years old. So essentially it was my first job, and 
I was immersed in the world of video games, and video games was my gateway into history because there's so many different things. Uh, of course, if you're not a gamer uh, or if you're that parent who's just getting that game for the, the kid, all you see is Fortnite, all you see is Call of Duty, all you see is Madden and FIFA. That's all you see, but there's so much more. There's games like Assassin's Creed, there's games like Metro 2033, and there's so many cool games. There's games like Red Dead Redemption. Uh, there's so many games that dive into so many different worlds, and uh, just specifically the one that immediately comes to mind is Assassin's Creed. And I really wish Assassin's Creed was around when I was a kid going to school because it touches on so many cool different parts of history. It touches on, you know, the Crusades in Jerusalem. It talks about the Revolutionary War in colonial Boston um, and the, you know, American Indian War and the French, how the French had an impact on that. And it talks about so many different things, and it teaches you in a way, of course, it's not historically accurate. It goes off on a branch of, hey, what if this happened? And I think that's when imagination comes in, and we kind of get involved in this world of what if this happened? And uh, we kind of can solve the problems uh, that were relevant in that time with, like, technology that wasn't available. Um, there's a really cool cartoon uh, that was out called Justice League Unlimited. I don't know if you ever watched it, but mm. it had no. – uh, Oh, it was so cool. When you get a chance, watch it. Uh, it was on Netflix for a period. But it had an episode where this guy called Randall Savage, who was essentially immortal, went back in time. He lived forever. So he was around when um, – you talked about time travel earlier. Uh, he was around when they invented time travel. He traveled back in time to World War II, and he gave the Nazis technology from the future and allowed them to win the war. Hmm. And it, the episode was around, like, hey, what if this happened? What if the Nazis won? What if Hitler was successful? And it introduced a new problem, and it was a new problem to solve for the heroes that we were watching. And that's what I kind of get obsessed with. What about you? What, what historical period or historical movie or book or show has have you been obsessed with? Hmm. Wow. If, if I had to put it down to a book, I would probably say All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. And I know that one's a little bit more of a uh, literary novel, but the history around that, the amount of research that he put into it, it's, it just makes you scratch your head because nobody should know that much about how World War II radios worked. <laughs> and I, I find I find it very interesting how it's almost like science fiction, but in reverse, he can build this world that's incredibly new to us because we've never been exposed to us, uh, exposed to it from the past. And, uh, I, I, yeah, just, uh, that's, that's one of the things that I was obsessed about for a little bit. Wow. I really have to check that out. Well, what's the name of that book one more time? Maybe some of the listeners might want to check it out as well. Yeah. It's called All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. And that book, it's it's really cool uh, because the chapters are really small. So I listen to the audio book version of it, um, and it's, some chapters are even two minutes long. Uh, others are 30 minutes long. But uh, the way that he, he tells the story, it, it jumps around between these two characters, which is a, uh, a, young, a young boy in Germany and a young girl in France. So for people who don't know a lot about the early history of of World War II, the invasion of France was this incredibly significant point in the war because it happened and it's just so fast because of the new kind of warfare. And he really captures that in the novel. He captures the chaos of of not just the military side of it, but the civilian side of it, which I'm I'm so interested in. What would have happened if all of a sudden you're being invaded by another country and you just have to move and you have you know you're not going to be able to fight. What would you do? And this this novel really answers that, and it tells it in uh, just a beautiful way. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, essentially, America's never been – I mean, we've had Pearl Harbor. We've had 9-11. But we've never been – and I don't want to diminish those points in history at all, but we've never been invaded. So it's definitely a situation where it gives – it adds perspective. And it's, that's why it's so important to know someone else's journey and to relate to someone else's journey. And, you know, speaking of journeys, you've had your own journey. 
when it comes to writing this book at 13 years old, starting to write the book, and last Thursday it coming out. So I'm sure that was a heck of a journey. If you take a look at the beginning of your journey and you take a look at the end of your journey, uh, well, your journey is still ongoing, but as far as caravan is concerned, what's the one thing that you started with that looking back now you would tell yourself, yeah, I probably don't do that? Huh. That's wow. That's a. I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> I would probably say, I would probably say, I know that I can overthink things sometimes, and I know that I can, I can push things to the point of perfection where uh, it, it never comes because you can never reach perfection. There's always, there's always something you can find to fix. And I think I, I don't know who said this, but I think it was Leonardo da Vinci who said, you know, all art is incomplete, uh, which is you know you just stop at a certain point you know you can always keep on going forever and uh i think for me it would be stop waiting for for perfection wow that's very introspective of you and it's very reflective as well and i and and even you know it shows a lot of growth for you to take a look at that and that experience has helped to, you to become who you are now as a person I'm sure your main character in your book goes through experiences that he can learn from. And we talked about journeys. I'm sure his journey starts one way and ends the next way. And I know I talked a little bit earlier about problem solving. I know as an author, um, as a writer, that's your main focus is problem solving. And at the same time, we also want to relate and empathize with this character because I think that makes us want to keep turning pages. What would you say is uh, the biggest problem without giving in away any spoilers what's the problem the main character in your book has to solve he has to solve he has to solve a couple problems he has to firstly he has to get across the desert which is the uh biggest problem because just coming from england and uh going to the heat of the sahara it, two different worlds entirely so he has to learn how to adjust and live the life of a, of a Bedouin and uh, make the cross in the first place. So that's the the first obvious struggle that we see him adjusting to, as well as just the culture shock of being in a completely different country, isolated from his old way of living and all that. And then I say that the second one would be is that as we see him going on this journey, a more subtle and a slightly more internal struggle starts to, starts to rise up. And that's the struggle of him realizing that he hasn't really been making the, his own choices in his life, that he wants to start taking more control. And and that leads him to having to make a decision, which is when he gets to the other side, is he going to just forget all the important lessons that he learned and say goodbye to this new life that he found and return to England? Or is he going to find a way, a way to uh, make his dream work and uh, live a new life and live the life that he wants to live? Ooh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. That's the sauce right there, man. That sounds really exciting. Um, I'm really looking forward to reading the book myself. I can't wait uh, to dive into it. And just to kind of wrap up here, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about any form of art, whether it be being a video game developer, whether it be a uh, movie director, uh, even if it's the host of a podcast or a radio show or TV show even, uh, there are several different forms of art that I think uh, people have a lot of misconceptions. Uh, being uh, an author yourself, which is also a form of art, and being in a way an artist as you craft stories and build worlds, there are a lot of people who may even be listening, who may come across this episode six months from now, a year from now, heck, 20 years from now, um, as we're listening to it in the microchips in our brains. Uh, they might come across this episode and have this misconception about being an author. Based on your journeys, your travels, your, you speaking with, uh, you know, aspiring authors who want to write their first book or their first novel, what would you say is the biggest misconception about what it is that you do as an author? Wow. I would say that the biggest misconception is that the idea for the novel, the the end product and the idea that you have are one and the same. And I know that, that for a lot of other writers, this just really stands true. You get this idea and once you start to flesh it out, or if you're the kind of person that just gets an idea and starts to just commits and writes, 
you begin to realize that there's a better version lying beneath it. Um, it's, it's a lot like meeting a person for the first time. You know, if you spend a, a little bit amount of time with somebody, you think you, you've got them figured out on, you know, just on the ground level. But if you start spending more and more time with them, which uh, writing a novel, it's like writing a novel is like being stuck in a rowboat in the middle of the ocean with this person. And as you're spending more and more time and you're trying to figure out where you want to go with it, you learn more things. And with that information, you adjust and you adjust. And uh, I'll tell you, man, this story from the first idea I had to um, the book that people are reading now, it is it is recognizable, but man, it has changed so much. <laughs> But that's good. I think everything, all things take change. Um, And I think the beautiful and sometimes frustrating part about being an author or just an artist in general is dealing with people's reaction to the work that you put together, especially when you have a vision for it and they come away from it with a different vision. But at the same time, and touching on a beautiful part about it, that's so cool. That's the cool thing about books. That's the cool thing about imagination. And that's the cool thing about art in general is you have this message and you say, this is what it means to me. This was based on my journey. And you can have somebody on a, a completely different side of the world, the country, the state, the city, read the same thing and get a completely different message from it, which I think is really, really cool. It's like both frustrating, especially when you want to convey a specific message, but it's so beautiful at the same time to show you like, hey, no matter how impactful your journey was to you, it could mean something completely different to somebody else. So that's what I'm looking forward to most out of your book is just relating to the main character and taking a look at how it impacted my perception and my imagination. So I'm really excited to get the book. This is plug time. Adam, where can people get your book? (laughs) All right. Uh, If you want to pick it up, you can get it on Amazon.com. If you don't like Amazon, you can get it on BarnesandNoble.com. Pretty much any online retailer, you can get it. The ebook uh, is going to be coming out here in about two weeks. Uh, There was a slight delay in release, but yeah, the ebook will be coming out shortly on iBooks, um, Kindle, everywhere. So. If you want to get the print, uh, now is the time to get it at Amazon. Or if you want to wait till the ebook comes out, you can get it at Kindle in about two weeks. Good stuff. Good stuff. Hey, Adam, this has been so much fun. Uh, one of my favorite interviews to date, and I've done over 20 interviews so far. And I'm really excited to for your journey personally. Uh, I'm really excited to see where this book takes you. And I can't wait to read it. And thank you so much for reaching out and thank you so much for being on the show. It was, it was a great time. I really appreciate it, man. I've had a good time as well and uh, keep up the good work with your show, man. It's awesome. Hey everybody. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that interview. It was really, really fun for me. I don't know if you could hear it in my voice, but I was talking about a ton of different things I was really passionate about. And I was really, really blessed to meet Adam. Adam was such a great guest on the show he the interview flowed very very well and i could tell he had a lot of fun and i'm hoping to have him back on in the future so hey adam if you're listening to this episode congratulations on the book launch congratulations on hitting a huge milestone in your life and congratulations on just being you man um you've had a heck of a life so far and your journey isn't over you have much more to accomplish and hopefully when you're a super duper famous author and you're making movies and publishing tons and tons of books you won't forget about the little guys you won't forget about uh the i'll talk if you'll listen show you won't forget about timmy b in the meantime everyone i'm going to get going so i can mix and master this thing down and get it out tonight and hopefully have it all ready for your viewing and listening pleasure uh, for this week upcoming if you have any feedback on the show whatsoever whether you want some feedback on you know something you're going through in your life whether you want to give me feedback on things the show does really well things the show can improve on or hell if you even if you just want to be featured on the show to talk about whatever maybe you have a business maybe you have a nonprofit. maybe you're thinking about going to grad school maybe you have a really strong opinion on marriage or race or politics and you just want to be featured on the show to discuss maybe you found something in episode 10 or 14 or 22 that you thought was really really cool and you have a really strong opinion on it 
reach out. I do not bite. And trust me, it will be fun. It will be productive. And I'm sure a lot of people will look forward to hearing you on the show. In the meantime, everybody, I'm going to get going. And as always, I'll keep talking if you listen. Take care.